trade was something to the tune of uh, 66 billion dollars mm -hmm. with China mm -hmm. and uh, up to I if I'm not wrong uh, up to June 2012 mm -hmm. the cumulative value of uh, Chinese contracts in India mm -hmm. stood at about 58 billion dollars mm -hmm. so you see that there is a new dimension that and a new reality that is taking shape and that reality is that the Asian continent is beginning to look at itself and to deal with each other and to harness the comparative advantages of all the countries. So I think to the extent that we can move in this path, mm -hmm. it will be good for all the countries. Hi Commissioner, we'll continue talking about China. Let's take a break and we'll be right back. Welcome back. Hi, Commissioner. Uh, coming back to China, would you be okay with uh, China building uh, the deep sea port at Sonadia, which is being planned, which has been on the cards for a while now? Uh, would not India's uh, strategic experts cry foul uh, again about the Chinese string of pearls around India? Or do you see Sonadia as useful to India to access its uh, northeast? Well, I think there are two questions in your question. I mean, the one is about Sonadia as a deep sea port, and the second is about a particular country uh, building that port. So I would like to separate the two here. So let me take the second one first. If you're asking me whether if we have a view on Bangladesh building a deep sea port in Bangladesh, mm -hmm. somewhere in Bangladesh, let's say in Sonadia, my response would, to it would be, India will support and welcome any development of infrastructure mm -hmm. which helps to revive and to take the Bangladesh economy forward. Mm -hmm. Insofar as which countries are building or contributing to the port, if there is uh, an investment or an infrastructure development which is what it is, then we would, uh, as I mentioned to you, uh, welcome that uh, development for Bangladesh's economy if it can contribute to uh, regional prosperity. The world is changing uh, and we have to acknowledge that uh, capital will flow from areas which are surplus to areas which are deficit and capital and investment will flow where there is demand. So you have a situation where the Chinese are sitting on large reserves of capital and investment. You have a situation where countries like Bangladesh are deficit in capital and investment and there is a mutuality of interest. Now, uh, we have always said in many forums, uh, both within Asia and globally and in the uh, um, you know, multilateral groupings like the Group of 20, the G20 and others, uh, where we work closely with China, that we really need to now begin to move faster in developing a cooperative framework which is unique to Asia and which leverages the strengths of individual countries. Because at the end of the day, what we would like to see for every country and for every member of the Asian continent is effectively more development, more equitable development, more inclusive development. Yes, naturally, our government has said that we will pursue our foreign policy based on enlightened national interest. So where we do see, if we do see a conflict between the aims which I have described to you and our security aims and our national strategic objectives, then of course there will be that line to cross. But keeping that aside, as a general proposition, the development of infrastructure in Bangladesh is something which, and which, which helps Bangladesh to develop its economy, is something which we would uh, definitely uh, welcome. Back to more specific bilateral issue. Uh, will India consider a comprehensive agreement uh, on sharing waters in all, uh, of, of all common rivers, as some Indian think tanks have suggested? Yes, I, I know that uh, there is a lot of discussion and a lot of work is being done on uh, how do we address the waters issue. Um, the Joint Rivers Commission was created actually in 1972. Uh, but it's not been in best of shape. 
this it's stage? not been meeting regularly for the last few years. Why is the case? Well, I think what happened was that uh, for many reasons, uh, a lot of the discussion was actually taking place outside of the framework of the Joint Rivers Commission. So um, uh, it was felt that uh, you know if you can get your work done through other forums, then let's uh, try that approach. But um, uh, in the last meeting of the Joint Rivers Commission, uh, we have agreed and we have identified six rivers on which we have agreed that we should begin work on discussing the sharing of these six rivers. This was in addition to uh, Tista and Feni. So I can see at a point in future that uh, this matter will come up for discussion between our two countries and we will have to s wait and see how uh, the two governments can uh, you know, agree on steps on how to move forward. But if you are bypassing such uh, institutions, agreed frameworks like I mean, uh, JRC, then people might lose their faith in such arrangements in future. No, the Joint Rivers Commission exists. It is, it is a, it is a established institutional mechanism. So I'm not suggesting for a moment that we bypass it. I was replying to your question as to why it has not met. The reason it had not met was because we had been able to move forward on uh, some of the issues, uh, even outside of the framework. But in every case. Uh, we had but to do you agree that it is to be made more functional? Absolutely, more absolutely. It's a, it's a, if you look at the if you look at the statute that established the Joint Rivers Commission, it is extremely comprehensive, and it uh, contains provisions not just for sharing, but for flood forecasting, for joint studies, for joint management, and it is very very comprehensive. So it was actually, and it's also very open ended. So it is not restrictive. It also has a provision for calling emergency meetings should the need arise. So it's a very, very uh, well-structured statute. And uh, there, will come a, uh, there will definitely come a time uh, in the not too distant future when we will have to come back to the table and discuss with Bangladesh uh, uh, the question of water sharing. And uh, I am hopeful that uh, in the coming uh, period, uh, this matter will be discussed again with Bangladesh. Hi, Commissioner, I have more questions on bilateral issues, but let's take another small break. We'll be right sure. back. Welcome back. Hi, Commissioner. One more bilateral, a major bilateral issue, land boundary agreement. How do you assure us? Simply that we are committed to its implementation. We are committed to its ratification. You know that the current bill for amending the constitution is pending in the Rajya Sabha, which is the upper house. And uh, the government is committed to building a consensus so that it can pass in parliament. And uh, this commitment has been reiterated by our new government by a new Prime Minister uh, to the Honourable Speaker. So we stand committed to it. And we will uh, try and take all steps necessary to see how we can move forward on this very the, important the issue. Assam or the West Bengal government will not be a problem this time? I would just like to say that we are developing the consensus. There is a new uh, kind of a political configuration in the country after the election. The new government is committed to it. They the new government doesn't need anyone, anyone's support. It has yes, the they, adequate uh, numbers. Fact, uh, the fact of the matter is that they have an absolute majority and uh, in the Lok Sabha, mm -hmm. and, uh, but perhaps not in the Rajya Sabha. Rajya Sabha. But uh, what is important is that they have given an assurance to your government uh, on the very first day of taking over, to be precise, on the 26th of May, that they're committed to implementation. And, of course, prior to that, the ratification. I'll come back to the border again, killings and stuff like that. But now tell me about the visas. People keep complaining about the Indian visa procedure. Getting an Indian visa is, is quite difficult. Why? Yeah, I'm you know, very sorry to hear that... Uh, we have not been able to uh, meet the expectations of the people. I would like to show you that this is something which we attach the greatest importance to. 
how we can help and improve our visa services. After all this middle classes, they are not going to settle in India. They are going to go and spend money. They are, they are tourists or health tourists. They are spending money in India. They are contributing to Indian economy. No, uh, Poor people from this country are contributing to Indian economy. Still, you are not letting them do it. Why? No. Uh, <laughs> there is, it's, that is not the answer to the question. We are in a constant effort to improve the services. What is actually happening is that there is a capacity problem which we have, that we are unable to cater to the kind of requests that are being made to us. Mm -hmm. And yeah, this is fine. in standard. Let me, uh, let me ask you another question. A young student from Bangladesh on a government scholarship studying in India has to go to a police station every time he or she arrives in India. Why? Well, I don't think that's true. Unless you know a case, but I yeah, can be happy I, I to check. Yeah, I know of a case, yeah. A I'm young girl, check. you know, at mm -hmm. the age of 19 or 20 who arrived in India to study on a government scholarship has to go to another district town every time she arrives in India to register herself with the local police. No, I'll be happy to check. But as a matter of rule, uh, if you're staying in India for a certain duration of time, you do not require any police reporting whatsoever. This does not apply to Bangladeshi nationals. It applies to nationals of some other countries. Bangladeshi but students not Bangladeshi. are being asked to do that. Well, I'll have to check exactly what is the reason why. And this Bangladeshi is being done. and uh, even the British nationals or uh, US nationals of Bangladeshi origin are being harassed. That's the allegation. Why? Well, um, if there is such a case, we'll be happy to look into it. But uh, my my feedback is that. Uh, we have done some reform even on the immigration side, um, which has actually been commented upon very positively by Bangladeshi travelers to India. And uh, as you know, uh, the other major liberalization which we have done jointly is that we have uh, removed the visa requirement for official passport holders. Mm -hmm. So that takes care of a large number of people. Yes. And of course, diplomatic passports were always exempt mm -hmm. from visas. So, um, and, and, and this uh, SARC visa exemption well, system Well, the SARC visa has is, is not administered by us. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's coming out of Kathmandu, the SARC secretariat. Yes. So, uh, Indians too have to... It used to, be, it, 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 it used to be one year and now it's, it's, uh, it's three months in some cases. Well, Why? that's a SARC decision. I mean, okay. that's uh, something which uh, uh, needs to be taken up at the SARC uh, summit or, or a SARC forum that we need to go back to some kind of a SARC visa. But insofar as Indian visas are concerned, I mean, we have a different regime. And uh, nowadays, uh, we are, uh, I can say to you, uh, we are able to issue uh, the bulk of our visas are actually long-term multiple entry. Another issue that makes big headlines in Bangladesh is trade. The two-way trade is heavily tilted towards India. Of uh, The figure is, two-way trade figure is $5.34 billion in 20. 2012-2013 fiscal and of which Bangladesh's exports were only 563 roughly half a billion dollars where you have about uh, you are selling about five billion dollars worth of products to Bangladesh any hope for Bangladeshi manufacturers of course I, th I think uh, this is an issue which worries us because trade has to be sustainable I mean uh, you cannot have imbalanced trade continue forever so, which is why we basically have opened the Indian market to Bangladeshi products. But there are complaints from the businessman that you are, you are, you are uh, slapping supplementary duties and other non-tariff barriers like, you know, you don't accept this BSTI, Bangladesh Standards and Testing Institution certification. No, what we are doing is we are giving national treatment. So, if a Bangladeshi product or an exporter is getting a certain treatment in India, he is getting the same treatment that is being given to an Indian manufacturer. Now, if the request is that I want treatment that is better than what we are giving to Indian manufacturers, that's a separate issue. But what we have done is that we have made a quantum leap in the trade regime between India and Bangladesh. But and how does it make sense? You know, you're saying that it's duty free and then you are, you are slapping uh, supplementary duties on Bangladeshi products? Not all Bangladeshi products. As I said, there are certain uh, levies or cess which are imposed, but these are imposed both on the manufacturer of that item in India as well as the manufacturer in Bangladesh. So there is, to that extent, uh, a regime which is uh, on equal footing. What we have done is, we have ensured that there are no quotas and there are no customs tariffs on Bangladeshi exports to India. And 
particularly in the textile lines, which were the most sensitive for Bangladesh. So we did that very consciously, despite opposition from our own textile uh, manufacturers. And if you look at the statistics and break down this figure of 563 million, you will see that the maximum percentage increase of Bangladesh exports to India has actually been in the RMG and textile sector. Of course, the base is very small, but there is potential. And I would only continue my job of spreading the message to the chambers and to business forums and investors in Bangladesh. Please do alter your business model and cater to 1.2 billion people. Land port infrastructure has not been in good shape. Do you think India can do more to support this? I agree. Help, I agree. If you're talking of barriers to trade, I would agree with you that land port infrastructure definitely is one barrier. And here I would blame both governments. And I'm happy to say that this government, our new government, is going to put a lot of emphasis on land port infrastructure. The problem has been that this infrastructure dates back to the 40s and the 50s and the 60s. Mm -hmm. And that is because we have not been able to cater to the demands of the petty businessman, the, the man on the border, who's actually grown up in his life, not doing multi-billion dollar business, but just doing day to day. And we are now embarked on a fairly ambitious program to improve our border infrastructure. And we are developing, uh, Khoda Gartala has been inaugurated last year. Patrapol Benapol should come up very soon. Uh, it accounts for 80% of our trade. And we have identified a few other land uh, ports which we will develop into integrated check posts.